Let me get to the report. I, I enjoyed it learned much from the draft report, uh, both conceptually and empirically. So my comments will focus primarily on conceptual issues. Um, maybe others will take up the uh, empirical questions more carefully. Uh, when I began reading this report, um, I was initially uh, reminded of uh, Dar's analysis of you know New Haven town local government politics and who governs. And I thought to myself, oh, this might be uh, you know uh, an interesting sort of investigation in a, in a similar way into Bangalore. Uh, but as I worked through the, the report uh, in great detail, I was reminded more of, uh, of, of a more recent reflection by Jacob Acker in the American. A political science journal um, on, on the value of moving from master theories in political science and political theory to a more a policy focused uh, political science. And he seemed to suggest that uh, both the empiricism and the uh, granularity and the level of institutional detail that policy focused political science brings to, uh, to the analysis might, might sharpen the way we do uh, political science more generally. I was struck uh, in, in why Jacob Hacker because I was struck in that the report showed uh, a, a claim um, made by Partha Chatterjee on the distinction between political and civil society uh, to be uh, to be uh, frankly unsustainable uh, that it didn't uh, withstand the empirical scrutiny that this survey evidence uh, brought to the table um, and and I suppose that with this kind of work. Uh, we, we might test our, uh, you know, our existing models of political theory more carefully and I can see great value in this sense. Um, the, the second thing that uh, I'll do is I'll turn more to the report and its, its, its contents and, uh, and its sort of inquiry into the concept and practice of citizenship. Uh, I think that the report is timely in, uh, in, an, uh, in an important way in Indian politics because new political parties like the AAP, uh, in their most insightful moments, um, have raised the, the prospect of, of continuous democratic accountability and, and sort of models of Republican citizenship. I suppose most uh, people in the room looking at the AAP today might not, might not uh, you know, see the results of that promise. Uh, but there was certainly a time when, uh, when we, um, those of us who, who follow and uh, try and understand Indian politics, uh, were, were, were quite uh, impressed by the ability to bring new ideas of citizenship to urban politics in India. And in that sense, I think this report is, is, is very useful. I want to focus on just three areas uh, of the report as, as, as questions or comments that uh, others may take up and respond to. Uh, the first, first piece is, is uh, Marshall's, uh, the youth of Marshall's uh, three pronged idea of citizenship as being civil, political, and social. And, and the, the, the sense I gathered was that uh, the, the report takes the view that translating Marshall's idea of social rights into an Indian context uh, doesn't, really, doesn't really work out. And it, it, it doesn't seem to work out in three ways. It doesn't seem to work out because our constitution doesn't express social rights, but instead speaks in terms of direct principles. Um, but uh, it, it didn't. It didn't. Uh, it was not clear to me that that was uh, that how that was conclusive on the question of whether you know the Indian basket of citizenship should include ideas of social rights. Um, UK and um, your uh, social rights are institutionalized at a statutory level or even lower at, at, at an administrative level. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not even clear that uh, constitutional entrenchment uh, matters that much. But I suppose the impression I got from the, from the report is that it goes from the idea that the social rights bundle is somehow not uh, uh, translated into the Indian context well. And, and hence it tries to, uh, you know, focus its attention on, on uh, you know, it, it suggests on the direct and basic measure of the extent to which civil and political rights have been translated into social rights. Uh, and the way to do that is to focus on basic public services and infrastructure. Um, I was, I, as I worked through the report, my, my sense was that that emphasis on 
uh, the social rights one can fade away. Uh, and I'm not sure that the, you know, the, the absence of a constitutional entrenchment uh, should somehow take its valency in, in the Indian political and, and administrative scheme to be different from, say, elsewhere in the world. Um, so that was my first sort of question or comment about uh, what is the place of uh, Marshall's idea of social rights and social citizenship in this uh, in this uh, report, and uh, you know how, how might one clarify it? The second uh, point in which I had some uh, doubts was about the distinction that the report makes between effective and social citizenship. Um, it seems to me that distinction goes something like this. Effective citizenship is the capacity of citizens to use their rights. And social citizenship is the capacity of citizens to translate their rights into outcomes. And in particular, the report says, to acquire basic capabilities independently of their social or economic position. As I worked through the report, I saw, I saw two strands. Both uh, effective and social citizenship seem to speak to the concern of how do you uh, establish a relationship between political or legal norms on the one hand and their practice. Uh, and it did seem to me, uh, and maybe deserves a closer reading or clarification as to whether that was what that what the core of that distinction between effective and social citizenship might be. Um, it, it seems to be a, 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 an important distinction for the report, uh, and so it, it might it might deserve some some closer attention. The, the third and the last point that I, I want to make. Uh, is, is about a, a theme in the, in the report uh, about practicing citizenship, and I found that uh, that that, that uh, said that this is really, I think, an evaluation of the empirical survey results. Uh, very, very interesting, along with three axes of knowledge, participation, and engagement. Um, the, the 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 two things that I thought might have uh, we might benefit from by paying close attention to is some comparative uh, uh, inquiries into you know into the same questions in other jurisdictions um, and 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 the idea of horizontal citizenship and let me explain this uh, a little bit so Elia Somin in a in a recent piece in, in on the US argues that uh, you know uh, argues about the relationship between uh, civic knowledge and uh, and participation and makes certain claims about the, the nature of that relationship in the U.S., uh, it might be interesting looking at the uh, looking at the data that we have here uh, to cast it in a comparative frame. Uh, it seems to me that we might we might we might get uh, it, it might alert us to some some of the peculiarities of the Indian urban landscape or maybe the Indian social scape more generally, uh, and it might be uh, very useful for this for this uh, report uh, and. The, the last thing that I, I, I want to say is, is about horizontal citizenship. One of the uh, parts that I, I read with interest um, and was, uh, and I think it's Patrick's reference, it's Patrick Heller, 2013, is, is, is about the value of conceptualizing citizenship along both its vertical and horizontal lines. And um, it, it, the, the sort of the associative, uh, you know, the value of uh, horizontal civic uh, association. Um, it's 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 striking to me that uh, in the uh, and, and I'm going to take this off on a slight tangent before I come back to the report um, that in the Indian constitutional debates this this was a question that was was addressed quite squarely um, and members of the Constituent Assembly were were very aware that uh, that the vertical relationship between the state and the citizen would not be enough. Uh, to to you know to carry out the transformative visions that they that they had in mind in the constitution, and it, at least it, uh, it felt to Ambedkar in the constituent assembly to stress uh, the need for this um, in some sense horizontal citizenship in, in the language of the report, um, and it seems that uh, this is an important idea. It's, it's an idea that's underemphasized in in. in um, Indian political life and Indian political theory generally, it's an idea that's picked up quite 
quite nicely in the conceptual discussion uh, a part of, of this report, but it was not clear to me how it translated into the index. And uh, as I and I'm, I'm not the, uh, you know I'm not the one to claim any mastery over the uh, the empirical side of the report, but it seemed to me that that the horizontal elements of citizenship seem to slip away a little, um, and it may be that horizontal citizenship doesn't have any direct instrumental uh, benefits in that it helps us to access basic services better in some way. Uh, but for all the reasons that the conceptual part of the paper picks up uh, so strongly, horizontal citizenship might well be a, a sort of precondition for the vertical citizenship relationship to work. That was certainly the way Ambedkar conceptualized it in the Constituent Assembly, uh, and it might be interesting for us to to examine and test that, that, that with the survey data that we have. So uh, to my mind, the more that horizontal citizenship comes into the uh, survey findings, I, I think we, we have a richer report with that. So let me stop there. I think I have uh, talked my way to 10 minutes. I'm sorry uh, if I'm speaking too quickly and not having an audience in front of me uh, might, might uh, you know, just lead me to prattle on, but I hope that I managed to, to make it three main ideas that I, I wanted to pay attention to. Uh, distinction, I mean, uh, translating Marxist social rights into social citizenship in the Indian context, uh, the distinction between effective and social citizenship as it's worked out in the report, um, and the case the, of horizontal citizenship in a back citizenship uh, would be three things that are already there uh, in the report but might. Uh, but might bear out uh, for the elaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sudhir. Uh, let me be your eyes for just a, a second and, and tell you that a lot of people are nodding in, in agreement with your comments. I think they were very clear and very powerful and very insightful. And I'll let Ashu and Siddhar later answer all of them. But in any event, uh, thank you for that. And next, we're going to hear uh, for 10 minutes from Partha. I was going to say funny stuff about how Bangalore's traffic is really bad because um, Sudhir in Bangalore is um, where there we are here, but uh, he just said same thing about institutional reasons. What he was doing in traffic, at least that's uh, Right. Uh, so let me pick up from where Sudhir left off uh, because I think that's the first um, issue on the horizontal section. And let me uh, try and suggest um, a connection between that and the instrumental part, which is the BSDII, uh, that the report was to uh, I'm, I'm dispensing with all the nice stuff about uh, the reports because um, at least three of the authors in the report are friends, and therefore um, I am hoping they'll sort of um, let me use the remaining 10 minutes to uh, just comment on it and not say the nice stuff. Uh, so, uh, first, um, one of the findings of the report is that horizontal separation is low in vertical separation. Uh, however, Table 17, which sort of puts that out, uh, is not disaggregated like most of the other stuff that's there. And therefore, we don't really have a sense of um, what is this horizontal citizenship across different classes and groups, uh, in which uh, the report discusses for a variety of stuff. And there I agree with uh, uh, that this sort of would be useful to get that uh, uh, stuff in place so that we can uh, unpack this story. And uh, why is that story, why is that unpacking important? Uh, that unpacking is important in some sense because uh, you also have a story about uh, a lack of engagement. Uh, and a lack of engagement, in, in some respects, that sort of leads to uh, poor levels of service delivery uh, outcome. I'm not saying they're possibly related. But uh, if you think about it, uh, how do you actually tend to move into uh, getting services? Is this um, individual rights bearing citizens who sort of show up and uh, uh, sort of claim, lay claim to certain things? Not for the kinds of services that you're talking about. You're talking about water, you're talking about sanitation, uh, you're talking about electricity, you're talking about roads. These are not services that are individually provided. They're services that are provided to community, uh, to locations. Um, 
So consequently, usually, and you know, uh, the, uh, it is uh, organizational practice, you essentially would end up trying to organize collectively. If you do try to organize collectively, at that point in time, it matters what your relationship horizontally is. If you have good, strong horizontal relationships, with horizontal citizenship story, where it matters to you what the other fellow has and does not have, then uh, the notion of collective action becomes stronger. And therefore, the channel through which you are essentially going to articulate the demands vertically are therefore, in my mind, strength. That's where I see the connection between uh, the two of them. And consequently, um, to me, it, uh, it's useful to try and unpack that story further. And since it's there in the data, it'd be nice to see that data. The other issue is, uh, as we saw from the presentation um, uh, that was made by uh, Ashu Bakar and Siddharth earlier in the beginning, the most sort of deprived areas, which is the type 1 and type 2 uh, housing types, are also very intensive in uh, the scheduled class schedule tribe uh, kind of structure. And therefore, there is that other aspect, uh, not of um, citizenship not just within that area, but also across the area. So uh, does getting services there require uh, the SCST communities to interact with non-SCST communities? And is that a barrier there that's preventing certain kinds of deliveries happening in that space? So there is an interesting story out there that I think uh, bears some uh, reflection on it. Right? Uh, so that's on the horizontal level. On the, uh, the second issue is something that Manisha picked up earlier and that Patrick sort of discussed uh, in the past, uh, uh, in the last session. So I won't sort of belabor that too much. Uh, is that all the services that uh, have been investigated here, whether it's water and sanitation, which comes from either versus B, electricity, which comes from Bangalore Discom, and roads, which comes from the MLA, are essentially agencies of the state. Uh, and consequently, you said the MLA is an important part of the story. You don't, for example, ask for the garbage is clear, which would be more cooperative and uh, I, I don't know, if you do, then uh, it would be nice to see that story again. Uh, now, uh, then the question arises, uh, what is, do we have anything in the survey that will sort of give, give us a sense of um, what is it, uh, how do um, you get to the MLA in some sense? Um, and uh, to that extent, um, it's interesting, um, since the entire analysis, I know this is very clear, I mean, especially uh, identifying the Muslim areas through using the spatial story, um, looking at uh, uh, making real use of the polling station data and the housing types uh, along the area. Uh, this is very carefully and interestingly done. So what I'm really therefore uh, curious about is why, since you're operating at the polling station level, why aren't you using both? Why aren't you figuring out who voted for what areas, what things, and does that make any difference whatsoever in what kind of outcomes you're getting there? Uh, you have the uh, POM 20 data, which means you have exact numbers of who voted for who in each of these cases, uh, and does it matter, for example, and I'll just come back to that in a second case, uh, when that does, does voting patterns matter uh, in that particular area? Who is the representative? Uh, is there uh, who is the cooperator, especially in these areas? Uh, is a cooperator from the same class or different class? Who is the MLA? Uh, and all of that story. The book, this for coming from um, the uh, my friends, uh, the politics of the governance of the city seem to be somehow hidden, uh, and uh, I would like that to be sort of foregrounded a little bit. Third, uh, the issue about uh, the concavity of the response. The, the whole uh, story that um, uh, I think that um, Ashu said was uh, an important finding of the uh, of this piece, which is the finding that um, uh, the poor have less of citizenship and less of public delivery, but get more service and infrastructure for the citizenship than others. That is, so basically, you have in some sense a concave function that slopes higher. Maybe name it. She talked. It's not uh, surprising in of itself. But um, uh, if you look at the numbers which drive that story, um, it's interesting. 
uh, it's interesting the line of another comment that Sudhir uh, made uh, at the beginning with respect to partner charity. Uh, now, uh, I'm no advocate of uh, uh, partner's sort of uh, separation, but in this particular instance, the numbers seem to sort of bear them out a bit, uh, if I'm reading the numbers right. So, uh, if you're looking at um, the result which is driving your story on the continuity of the response, uh, you basically uh, say that, and here I think there was a question also in the previous session of this magnitude of the effects. Uh, the numbers, uh, at least that's there in the handouts for you, seem to essentially indicate that uh, while class pulls you back um, quite a bit, the class pulls you back almost two standard deviations uh, from where you were, citizenship puts you right back. Uh, so the citizenship uh, effect actually almost fully compensates for the uh, class effect that you actually had. Now, how does it actually compensate for that? Uh, the Siddharth mentioned earlier that the citizenship story, especially in the bottom two housing types, which is what the numbers are, and you can look at the uh, tables 38 and 35 to unpack that, uh, essentially are not about knowledge, they're about housing. That's what's driving the citizenship index in, the, in those two housing types. And if that, is, if that is the case, what you're essentially showing is that the poor are using political participation as a way of claiming certain kinds of services which they wouldn't have been able to otherwise, which may not be, uh, I mean, it's equivalent to whether or not it's uh, up part class domain, but uh, I would say it's not inconsistent with the way his uh, uh, sort of puts that stuff together. Uh, so that's one part of the story. Um, so as far as Bangalore is concerned, uh, is uh, part actually right? The second part of the story that I would really, I think, find very interesting is uh, actually the um, figure 11 uh, in the citizenship in the practitioner's report. Uh, and if you look at figure 11 in the practitioner's report, what you find is that there is a very nice, especially in the former slums, uh, a very nice um, uh, linkage between high citizenship indexes and high, uh, higher uh, BSDII scores. Right? So, and here this goes back to your story, uh, Patrick, about spatiality. These areas which are high BSDII and high CI, what are they? You know, what kinds of spaces are these? Which are the informal slums which have high citizenship and high BSDI? It also goes back to the question that we raised earlier about um, the supply demand uh, sort of uh, story as to whether or not we're missing something uh, there and can we use this kind of stuff to build in some exogeneity to sort of get some uh, answers in that area? Uh, because as uh, Patrick mentioned earlier, this is largely a supply side story, uh, um, a demand side story. Does this kind of story let me uh, ask some supply side questions? Uh, and so that it'd be nice, uh, and you know, Janakara is one institution which uh, I know is extremely competent in spatial stuff. So this would be even more uh, something that one would expect from a report that's coming out. Uh, so that's as far as the uh, top three stuff. Going forward, um, uh, just uh, 30 seconds more, um, it would be nice, I know, uh, I think the housing type is a really clever idea, but it would be nice in the report and the others, and maybe you know, put it out in the, you know, anybody out the net, one could sort of work a little bit more, get the um, interaction with the other class variables that are coming in, uh, talk a little bit more about uh, gender and BSDII and the occupation. Um, uh, I know you, you have just taken away occupation and everything else, you're focusing on housing type as a measure of class. But occupation also has issues about uh, can you be there to articulate your rights? Are you out and gone, you know, 16 hours a day? What exactly are the other people in the household doing? So there's a bunch of pretty mundane kind of stuff which might have some action, therefore the story is. And finally, um, some, uh, is there any way we can get at, uh, you know, the clever way in which we did the mosques and other stuff story in the, such is there any way we can get at something that I know Patrick is very interested in, which is the surface area of the state. We pointed out that the figure 14 in the practitioner's book uh, gives this wonderful thing about, uh, a picture about Durban, well, wonderful otherwise depending on the uh, number of principal staff, but 
100,000 uh, 100, citizens is 3,000 in Durban, South Africa, and 350 in Bangalore. Uh, it's also the case that in um, the US, uh, actually has more government employees. Absolute numbers, not per capita, not per population. The US has more government employees than India. Right? We have four times the population, but as just the number of government employees, we have fewer government so it isn't the, so the surface area of the state matters. Is there any way, through institutions, through stuff, through uh, you know whatever, that you can get some clue about the places uh, or the spatial varieties, to um, uh, spatial differences about the surface area of the state? Without, without, whether it's the media, so the BWS is being office, whether it's the pumping station, whether it's a, you know some kind of um, structure that you're doing. Uh, and um, on the longitudinal issue that uh, Ramesh uh, brought out a couple of times, I'm just hoping that that means that this agenda will be continued for some time. So, uh, what is really hoping to see uh, a lot of work in the future. Uh, just one small cautionary variable. Uh, if you're going to stick with housing types as uh, a class, that is the one that's most likely to change over time, both in C2 as well as by uh, movement of people in the country. I would uh, like to first look at the methodology just a bit, because I think uh, just is to make a very brief point that when you are looking at designing a sam sample, there is a chance sometimes of an over design, and uh, whether the ex very, very clever work done regarding Muslims and Shaduka Shadu tribes by exaggerating their share in the sample has, has hurt in some sense. And this is a problem that goes well beyond your study and I think many of us face the same problem that when we're dealing with India, we, we don't trust randomness enough. We tend to over-design and, and do that and I think it's a problem all of us have faced it sometimes when we're looking at large samples. But I just thought, when you go to further cities, whether that additional <coughs> work you have done with regarding to Muslims the scheduled caste is necessary, you might want to think about that. Uh, the second thing is that uh, many of the categories, including housing type, uh, have, I think at one level, when we do large samples in Bangalore, in fact, all over India, we have found it useful to make a distinction on roof types. Typically, a, a sheet roof and a concrete roof represents two very different classes of people. But in Bangalore, when that, that category would deal with only the extremely poor, the others would get clubbed into one. And the problem there would really be that uh, where do the poor actually live? And we did a, a survey around last year, but not as big a sample as yours, but not exactly a small one, 2,500. And uh, we found that a very, uh, hardly a third of the poor, if you take it in terms of asset, uh, assets they own, hardly a third, third of them live in slums. The rest are really uh, in different types of, of, of arrangements, largely because 80% of the poor live in rental housing. And then that rental housing can be a small part of anything, including a small outhouse in a large apartment complex in which you act as a security guard or whatever. So you have multiple arrangements like that which get blurred over when we look at this. So the question is not that there is no value in what you're doing, it's an extremely useful construct, but whether it needs to be adjusted with some of the other data that you have to come up with a more robust uh, definition of class or an indicator of class, uh, class in your work. Similarly, when we're looking at Muslims and it's a striking result that it's not there, before we go through with it, we need to see whether the variation within each of those categories, in those Muslims and Christians, is the same. Otherwise, when you make that comparison, it's misleading. And I think if we look at the way the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe population is, is much poorer than the rest of the Hindus, I wonder if you'll get the same result if you compare the caste Hindus, the non-scheduled caste, scheduled tribe Hindus with the Muslims. Because what you might be getting is an average of scheduled caste in the well-done Hindus along with a generally lower level of, of Muslims, a slightly significantly lower level of Muslims for Muslims. And I think this is something you can check, it might be right or wrong, but it's, it, it's, you know, it's easy for you to check that. And I just, I mean, before getting on to a, a larger argument about the conceptual level, just one other statistical uh, thing, that is how much of the lack of participation or effective citizenship is because of the absence of the state. 
And I think there's one, uh, it is not just a matter of the richer households in, in the sense that I was speaking about. We found that 33, we asked them, one of the questions we asked that to get, get a sense of health or reliance on public health is that where, you know, over the last three years, those who had a child, who, who had a child born over the last three years, where was the child born? Right? And as high as 33% of them said at home in the slums of Bangalore. So that is, is a crisis of the urban delivery system. I'm not sure it's an indicator of situation. Right, if you have a situation, to put it very crudely, where your child can get called up, pulled away by a dog because uh, you're just giving a, a corridor to sleep on when you go to Victoria for a childbirth, it's not really a matter of citizenship. It's, it's, a, it's a massive crisis of the state that's pushing that. You might want to factor that in. But the larger conceptual issue, I, I felt really, if I may uh, <clears throat> use a little bit of theory, but mainly go back to local history. The, Larger conceptual issue, I think, would become clearer if you make a distinction that uh, uh, Francis Fukuyama makes in his latest book, Political Order and Political Decay, released a couple of months ago. Now, he makes a distinction between the patron client relationship, as existed in, in Italy, and the clientelism that dominated the United States, making a very important point, I think, he doesn't state it that way, but to my mind, a very important point from the Indian context, where Essentially, the movement to clientelism is a sign of democratic democracy, right? Because in a patron client relationship, it's the elites that control it. But when you come into clientelism, it's a free for all where you get new elites that generate and then use the support of the people who to get working uh, to that point. When I see your results as they have emerged from this report, they tend to strengthen they tend to strengthen the argument that essentially what Bangalore has seen is a movement from a patron client relationship in the pre-independence era to a system of clientelism, particularly in post-emergency, post-Devrajar's uh, Bangalore. Right? In the previous period, you had an elite, you had a great deal of patron client, uh, client uh, relationships, and those relationships were strengthened by culture, the respect for the Maharaja, the respect for uh, uh, for Mirzai's men, the whole institutions that were built around individuals who strengthened the patron client relationship. The Devrajar Sira saw a break in that. He took it into the level of clientelism, and that is in itself, when seen in a dynamic sense, a major step towards democratization. Now, it does, as it happens in the in the US, and I think uh, Ashur's study on, uh, 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 on the uh, on the comparison between India, China, and, and the US, uh, which, which is ongoing at ground, will bring this up very strongly. It does tend over time to move from clientelism into outright corruption, just un, unfettered corruption, and that we might well be in the process to doing that. And then it's argued uh, by Fukuyama and some others as well that that process will necessarily lead to greater demand for citizenship because over time, as more people come in, you will get a greater strength if people will get into it. You could argue that uh, an occupation-wise uh, result will help show whether this is true, but you could argue that the IT industry, people working in the IT industry are much more sensitive to citizenship than those working in, say, the garment industry. And you can you can get those patterns. It's available with you with your data, and it, it would be interesting to see those results. But the point that we need to keep in mind is that, is this process a natural one, right? And is, are there levels of suspicion about whether the movement towards citizenship is actually a move, move a return to the old elitism? And this can happen in Bangalore for, the, for several reasons, some of which I think, once again, are borne out by your study. In fact, your study bears out this argument very strongly because it, when you say the life of Bangalore citizens is vote intensive, it's a part of the patron of the clientelism. When you say rights are more, are more important than horizontalism, it's once again part of clientelism because you're competing between groups for the same, to get the benefit of the same rights. So you cannot respect your fellow citizens, you have to argue that my case is stronger than hers. Right? The capacity to use lies is highly differentiated between knowledge and power, but not in participation, the poor participate. Again, the poor benefit from participation, which is what the purpose of a, of a clientelism is really to ensure that the poor get the support, right? And then there is, as a part of the group formation, 
There is the inability of the poor to act independently of their social and economic position class. This entire set of findings fits in perfectly with the argument that what we have done is move from a bit, uh, period of uh, greater client relationships into one of clientelism. But if you're going further and saying that it would lead to a period beyond corruption, then we need the level of suspicion within Bangalore about the possibility of a new elite emerging that will act like the old patron-client uh, relationship is not, uh, you should not be uh, dismissed very lightly because uh, you see signs of it, there are fears of the return of the elite, partly in terms of caste. You find once again in the same study, caste that are recognized as backward proclaiming themselves to be forward. I think you mentioned that and it's come out very strongly in your data as well. So you end up with a majority being in the forward caste though technically a majority, vast majority of Bangaloreans are supposed to be backward caste. Right? You also find it in terms of spatial uh, division. I know it's not a part of your study, but I think anyone who lives in Bangalore knows the aggressive mobilization towards, towards vegetarianism. I think the number of spaces in the city that are now become exclusively vegetarian, which weren't so in the past. And then the process of, of segregation, this is, uh, I think, among Muslims is something that we have recognized as a spatial dimension. But our study, which uh, looked at, at broad caste categories, found the tendency towards, you could call it enclaves or ghettos, I won't get into that, but the fact remains that it's equally strong among backward castes. If you see it in terms of, of uh, individual castes, you cannot spot it, but if you aggregate caste into forward and backward and official categories, the tendency for the backward caste to also move towards areas where they are clear is very, very strong. So you have patterns there that, that, are, that people are worried about. And the third element that uh, concerns uh, that people might precede the rise of citizenship as actually the rise of a, re a return to old style elitism is that the discourse built around citizenship often ignores the poor. Typically you might argue for instance that metering of water is very important. And then when you meter the, the water, the fact is that the poor typically do not have access to water. And as the cost of water goes up for a variety of reasons, including energy intensive, including the fact that you're paying your tourist local sources, including the fact that you decide to grow in the north when the source of water is in the south and therefore energy costs, right? Whatever the facts, the poor are, are forced to get into it and that hurts them. The point about it is also that there is a complete tendency to ignore the relationship between the rural and the urban, what was called, uh, what we now call the floating population. But essentially this is very, very critical because you find in Bangalore's industrialization a large growth of industries that are feminized, highly feminized, including the garment industry. And the reason for that is because the women can come in for some time and then go back to the village. And they have a, a very high degree of attrition and that suits industries, including global industry. They don't have, that's one way of getting past the labor laws. They don't have to face the problem of, of any kind of a long-term permanence. And this process, in our st another study that was done on the garment industry, we found that over 25% uh, uh, of women workers in that industry, the children of over 25% uh, of the children of women workers in the garment industry could not live with the mother. Right? And, they, and if you take the children below five years, it was up to 40%. So at large, they typically stay in the village and work within that. And so any clear idea of urbanization being linked to citizenship directly would not necessarily hold. In fact, Patrick's studies, I think, show that for Kerala, but I think you'll find a similar result if you look at, at Bangalore and around that. I'll just end with one uh, story or, or a little bit, a little anecdote when we were doing the JNNUR study. Uh, we're looking, asking similar questions and asked uh, a, a, a poor household. It wasn't sure it was in Mysore, but I think it would hold here as well. As to, uh, oh, oh, I'm about service delivery on water, and, she, and this lady just turned around and asked us, why is it after all this thing that you talk about, you cannot give us what the Maharaja gave us? So the issue really is that we shouldn't rule out the possibility that uh, people might believe that a return to greater client relationship in some cases, at least the traditional ones, is better than a, a linear movement towards citizenship that we otherwise tend to do. So I think we should just open the floor. I, these are three extraordinary set of comments that have 
touched on method, touched on measurement issues, touched on the larger theoretical issues, the causal claims. Um, and I, I would love, I would rather give preference to uh, the public to comment on the comments. And then maybe if there's time, uh, Mashu or Siddharth can say something. But I think we'll have further opportunities during the course of the day to, to intervene. So on that note, I'd just like to open it up. And uh, maybe we'll take a series of questions. And then uh, the panelists can respond and others to respond as need be. But Ashu wants to go first. No, I, I just want to say these are three extraordinary set of uh, comments. And uh, it's with much gratitude uh, that uh, we would be able to, with, with, with much gra gratitude that I acknowledge uh, this, and this will help us greatly as we move forward. So the comments uh, were both about the methodological steps and the conceptual steps, and uh, were truly precious. So citizenship, uh, you know, bring back, uh, <laughs> Taking charge and delight uh, becoming more powerful. It's a fear. It's a fear. Yeah, yeah, because you know, so among the citizens also, whoever is vocal who is going to be more powerful, that person will start leading the whole thing. And that person will start leading what he or, he or she wants. So ultimately, the person who at the bottom will never get what he, what he or she wants. I think I really appreciate the one very well. How do we strike a balance? What are, the, what are the best way to do it? This is one question. The other one is about the housing references which you've taken for the survey. Um, the type 3 house I can afford in central business district, but I can afford a type 4 or 5 somewhere else. So uh, maybe income or type of work as somebody suggested could be more uh, uniform across. But of course, if the same income person lives in central business business, business he, he will have to sort of you know spend more or something like that. I don't know the yet whether the yardstick becomes uh, uniform across. That's one point. And this I think I would like to hear a little more from you. <laughs> ಅವಿಶ್ವಾಸ <laughs> Slum and Lakir was our and on the Berlin on the Kadege Hakir Vantatu. Our rehabilitation and on the Hanta the Liberibere, Savaratha and Portavan the Hedir Vantatu. Nijaku put a Savaratin a Hinde or Anubus Pirvanta no me in Vanta. Even the Dikinali, even EWS quarters issues and Telmana the Vandaga. Any evictions Agir Vantatu and Ali, our Aki was the road, Horakir on the Sandra, the Lukuda. Nama High Court Tagli or Supreme Court Tagli or Kirtir on the Yen or in the Yen and a Kirta in the Renta. Inu Dikinali, Ella basic service facilities privatized after one the Dikinali, even the now citizenship index by the Suchaka Baki Mata Tidewe, Nijma Kurunama, you know, Nagar Dilimanta, deprived communities any day. Auro Adana Parkari Sadha Aktea, and a good table thing in our Kalut Peku Yelagano at the Hedilaka, Nijuaku put a citizenship or a gay in Ame Kadatenta. Even in Adina, Yavade, Old Kamagarigala, Yelaste Kamagarigala, Yelamu Puda, Pere Hanta the Lire Nijuaku put a Yaro in the leaf players, either in the Yaro, Mutuajin or his Kondo, Munuk Taitare, Agle Hedila, we like capture of. Uh, urban governance and the head Kondaga. Nijuaku Adili Naditir on the Diria City, right to city of urban deprived communities and the head Daga, Yili Renta, Muki Prashnil. Narendra, would you? Tell me if I'm translating right. <laughs> uh, essentially, her concerns are about uh, elite, what she ended up with elite capture of governance and how this elite capture of governance. 
has led to a situation where we talk of its citizenship index, but we don't uh, look at the cost that some other the poor have to pay to be a part of it, the pain of the poor when it comes to eviction, the tendency of the judiciary to question the poor while allowing private, the private sector to do what it wants on the grounds of privatization of services, and how the user must pay completely ignores the reality of the conditions facing the poor. I'll just try to summarize it and I hope I've got I think if I can just add to uh, what I heard from here later, I think she also, we were also talking about you know, very specific examples of, for example, the PWS quarters getting uh, torn down in Ichipura, for example, right? To say that while all of this has been going on, really the idea of citizenship itself, it, you know, doesn't work for them because it doesn't help them. Even when they engage, it doesn't really help them. So I think that was a very large point that she was uh, sort of making to say that participation in citizenship, but in actual terms, when they have issues, uh, it doesn't really help them. There, there are two more issues. Uh, I mean, you we were talking about examples of Dendeshwar and uh, what is privatization in Karnataka, where uh, some uh, civil, uh, civil society organizations have been instrumental in bringing what is privatization in Karnataka and Karnataka. questions here and then we'll have to stop and give Melissa a chance to respond. Uh, thank you. Uh, just very quickly take this last point on elite capture forward. Uh, Delhi has a very classic example of how that happened. Uh, this was Bhadi Dari, which was the platform that the previous chief minister had uh, you know, evolved. And it was completely elitist because it was for organized resident welfare associations which excluded all the poor. So, so therefore, um, yes, there is a concern around the fact that some of these institutions or platforms for participation would have this kind of, um, you know, tendency. But just to go back to, uh, you know, you've used uh, housing as a, as a proxy indicator for class. I'm wondering, and I haven't read your report in detail, so maybe I could be wrong, have you looked at services and unbundled uh, the uh, service quality as also one of your indicators? Because if you look at the way slums get access to, let's say, water, their water access is 10 LPCD, 40 LPCD via tanker, via shirt stand post. The access at the high end is 24-7, whether that's through a coping mechanism, but it is treated municipal supplied water. Now, if you know, uh, when you are at the ground level, uh, what happens is that when you have that kind of service at, uh, at a fairly reasonable level, means water comes regularly about two hours a day, you are, in a sense, satisfied with that level of service and your aspiration for the next level doesn't exist. So I'm just a little curious whether we, uh, you know, captured not just the, I mean, we, we unlumped the housing, but did we unlump the uh, other services equally because they, they are quite, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they do have an impact on the level of citizenship. You know, if, I, if my water is fairly decent, I'm, because that's what I'm expecting, so I will not, you know, uh, engage with my local, you know, councillor or my MLA for a better service. Uh, there's, there's, there's two more questions here. I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is with regard to the fact that you're saying class matters more than caste and gender and uh, religion. So how would you capture that in a survey? Is there a movement of sensitization of people reporting that they're forward class, etc.? I feel that since this is not a one-off and that you can take it forward and that you'll have survey polling boards, you can actually conduct qualitative uh, studies because many qualitative studies would go completely against what you all have said with regard to class. So since you can identify on the index a word that rates high and a word that rates low, you could, I think, take this forward. 
on a theoretical uh, point of view, I'm surprised that uh, very little attention has been given to the entire judicial debate with regards to rights. So rights didn't come up just with the enactment of right to education, etc. that has come up recently. But from 1951, you have the debate of which is better, fundamental rights, DPSPs. There's a whole debate with regard to the Supreme Court and with regard to civil rights versus social and civic rights. So I was wondering if you could include that because that's a huge part of our uh, theory. Right, so there's a book about the... Uh Eastern client relationship before the Rajas, and when the Rajas came around, there was a thing is called, called clientelism, with the implication that it's more meritocratic than traditional. No? Sorry. Well, well, the distinction is that uh, uh, is that the primary client relationship is the traditional elite, which offers, I think, to people who are its traditional clients typically, whereas this is really about new, uh, new. Elites emerging, which claim, uh, which function in the same way, but they are new, so they don't have the benefit of tradition. They are much more competitive, and they rely much more on voting power, or the power of the numbers to vote, which is con perfectly consistent with the results. Uh, just want to really mention, I mean, uh, so this it could be capture of power by the new elites in the sense that it's self-propagating, because. Uh, you know, once they have money, then they can buy votes and play the system, etc. So, the comment by some person that, you know, they can't give us even what the Maharaja gave us could be just about the efficiency of the new elites versus the old elites. And that's all. Right. Yeah, so, Okay, uh, I think broadly there are two sets of questions here. One that relates, uh, that relates to the poor, and the second is one between the new elite and the, and the old one and which. I think it's really an issue of are we willing to see the process of citizenship or rights within a city in absolute terms, or are we willing to see it as a process? Right? If we see it as a process, I think we will have to recognize that clientelism is more important you see, let's remember that much as we like to present the city as a, as a very very modern, global construct, even in the, uh, the most recent census, I think around 20 to 25 percent of the women in Bangalore are illiterate. They don't have, have literacy yet. So you're talking about a crisis that is still there. You're still looking at, at uh, Patrick made the point of the work leaders being the major people coming in because of the crisis in agriculture, and the ones who have the uh, have the, I would like to use the word social capital, who have the capital to, to migrate are really the better ones, not the better of ones, not the ones who are that more ready, desperate. So we have a process where I would say that uh, that essentially we are moving from patriot time to clientelism, hopefully towards citizenship. Right? But if citizenship is seen as being captured by the elite like everything else is, there will be a resistance to that. Right? And in that resistance, the fact that people have access to identity groups, whether it's caste, access to intermediaries, I think the bulk of the services that were delivered even in your data is from intermediaries, which could be caste heads, could be anybody else who would have. We're forced to fall back to that. I think if you look, I think the example that was given of Ejipur Aslam was one in which uh, uh, they tried to fall back directly just on individual citizenship rights. And you know, it was the response of the state was brutal. Right? So that's clearly something that is not working. Right? Similarly, on the question of water privatization, the general issue of if you're a city in which people are migrating, the poor are migrating in very large numbers, and you decide that you're going to take away public tax, which Bangalore did, right? what do they do? If you decide that you're going to move into a system where garbage is going to be collected through fire, by large uh, three wheelers or whatever, four wheelers or whatever, what do the poor do? They will drop it in the street corner. Right? So you have to work, uh, the, the idea of movement towards citizenship, all I'm saying is not inevitable. It is, it is something that can happen, should happen, but it's very easy if there's an elite capture of that movement that you will go back into alternative forms, which as you rightly point out is, is far, far, far from ideal. That is one element. As far as the condition of the poor go in this whole process, there has been, I think, uh, I personally believe since 2000 in particular, Bangalore has faced the crisis of the elite. 
And that is something that we're facing. I think we don't realize that even today in Karnataka, in the chief minister's constituency, chief minister's village, where he allowed a Dalit woman to be the cook in the uh, in your uh, uh, school uh, uh, midday meals, the elite caste refused to eat. He has had to mobilize mats, he has had to mobilize Lingayat, Lingayat leaders to just get the caste to eat the food cooked by a Dalit cook in his own village. Right? That's the level of the social crisis we are facing in Karnataka. There's no point brushing it under the carpet by comparing it with New York or or India. I'm not for a moment saying such comparisons should not be done. I think our first study on on uh, the early period in, in the in the U.S. would be something that uh, that would give us would give us a lot of pointers. But I think we also need to study locally and, and get a realistic position of where we are. Please. I completely agree. I was trying to say that. Uh, yeah. but I, I'm not, sorry, I don't mean it as a disagreement with you, but I'm just saying that we need to recognize this as a process and recognize that there is patronage uh, system. If it exists, if it's better than the past, then it's okay. Then we need to go along with it and absorb it into our lives. We really have to wrap things up. Sure. Uh, so, so, quickly, a few things I think um, I'd like to highlight. One, um, just to follow up from what uh, Brenda just said. I think it's important that one re-examines the discrimination story. Yeah. And the reason for that goes back um, to something which uh, I've had problems unpacking and assimilating, but uh, it's out there, so I'll put it out there. Uh, Arun Selva, who works a lot with uh, slum communities here in Bangalore, uh, claims that slums are essentially spaces of spatial segregation. And the idea that uh, the Shidur class and Shidur tribes are kept away and hopefully, as a, in the Ejipura situation, outside of the central city in the same way that in Dalit villages, I mean in villages you have separate um, Dalit settlements and structures. Now that's that's a huge claim to make for Sikh right? Uh, does it have validity? Does it have structure? But that is a narrative. And when you confront that narrative as something with a right to it, it's in the background against which you're claiming rights, uh, then it becomes uh, quite complicated. And especially uh, to add to that, um, one of the markers that uh, is used in some sense to discriminate precisely on the basis of caste is what I the call this That I'm perfectly happy to allow anybody to stay in my outhouse and be a security guard as long as they're vegetarian. And that automatically sort of excludes the certain communities from moving forward. So that's one part I think that is important to uh, look into and from quite from our structure. Uh, second is the whole issue of engagement and uh, the one that was what about engagement with whom? Because a lot of the structures of engagement which have secured certain rights, especially against eviction, which is one of the major ones, uh, and um, for housing rights, has been with the courts. And uh, it's it's an it's a part of our system which, I mean, this particular survey doesn't engage with both knowledge and the participation of our engagement with the courts and that. So that's something that could perhaps be done for future research. Uh, finally, I think I would stay, uh, I sense some hesitation in your presentation when you talked about the rich subverting situation. And I would stay with that language. 